Welcome to the Heart of Westmoreland Mission Community Sunday Service. In a moment I'm going to light a candle to symbolise this oasis of prayer for us all on a Sunday. Um, and I'm going to uh, invite all of you, if you have a candle at home, to light a candle too. So if you have a candle um, would you like to pause this service for a moment, get the candle and then come back and then we'll light it together, shall we? OK. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you now and forever. Amen. For our Thanksgiving prayer, I'm going to pray a meditation by St Francis of Assisi on the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, most holy, our Creator, Redeemer, Consoler and Saviour, who art in heaven, in the angels and the saints, enlightening them to know for you, Lord, our light, inflaming them to love for you, Lord, our love, dwelling in them and filling them with happiness. For you, Lord, are supreme good, the eternal good, from whom all good comes, without whom there is no good. Hallowed be thy name. May knowledge of you become clearer in us, that we may know the breadth of your blessings, the length of your promises, the height of your majesty, the depth of your judgments. Thy kingdom come, that you may rule in us through your grace, and enable us to come to your kingdom, where there is clear vision of you, perfect love of you, internal, eternal enjoyment of, of you. Thy will be done on earth as in heaven that we may love you with our whole heart by always thinking of you, with our whole soul by always desiring you, and our whole mind by always directing all our intentions to you, and by seeking your glory in everything, with all our whole strength, by exerting all our energies and affections and body and soul in the service of your love and of nothing else, and we may love our neighbours as ourselves, by drawing them all to your love with our whole strength, by rejoicing in the good of others as in our own, by suffering with others at their misfortunes, and by giving offence to no one. Give us this day, in remembrance understanding and reverence of that love which our Lord Jesus Christ had for us and of those things he said and did and suffered for us. Our daily bread, your own beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive us our trespasses through your ineffable mercy, through the power of the passion of your beloved Son, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And what we do not completely forgive, make us, Lord, forgive completely. 
that we may truly love our enemies because of you, and we may fervently intercede for them before you, returning no one evil for evil, and we may strive to help everyone in you, and lead us not into temptation, hidden or obvious, sudden or persistent, but deliver us from evil, past, present and to come. Amen. And now we have our time of recollection of those times we have fallen short as a community, as Christians, as human beings, especially in the trying times of this uh, uh, coronavirus restrictions, all, all the suffering this causes and the, the great burdens it places upon people. Holy God, we confess to you before the company of the faithful in heaven and on earth that we have sinned against you, against one another and against your creation. Forgive us in your mercy. Help us to forgive each other and to hold in reverence all that you have made. And now we hear the assurance of forgiveness of sins. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today we hear readings from 1 Kings about Elijah and uh, Jesus walking on the water in the Gospel of Matthew and this is our theme prayer for today. Almighty God who sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church open our hearts to the riches of your grace that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love and joy and peace through Jesus Christ your Son our Lord who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit one God now and forever amen and so we now listen to our two readings the first lesson is taken from the first book of Kings chapter 19 beginning to read at verse 9 the Lord appears to Elijah there he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper, when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also, anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel, and anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve seven thousand in Israel, 
all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is taken from St Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, beginning to read at verse 22. Jesus walks on the water. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up into the mountain by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves, because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Jesus got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards him. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, crying out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Thanks be to God. Well, at last, the weather has given us a moment of calm after a long storm that's seen terrible winds and lashing rain for several days here in Cumbria, such as the state of British summer these days. I've tidied up my entries for the tallest sunflower competition that were strewn all over the lawn here uh, after the storms. Uh, but I've still got a few things to sort out here around the garden. It's eerily appropriate, isn't it, that today's gospel reading is about a storm. Not just because of the summer we're having at the moment, but also because of the way that life is cutting up rough at the moment. Here in the Eden Valley, it's not just our well-publicised COVID R rates that's the problem. The bigger problem is all the knock-on effects, particularly those suffering with other conditions and uh, those who've lost loved ones at this time through non-COVID deaths, but it's a particularly difficult time to lose a loved one. The whole of life is a bit like a sea that moves from beautiful calms to rough, threatening waves with very little notice. And as we search for the meaning of all of these storms, it challenges us to think about the nature of God. It's interesting that in Mark and Luke's accounts of the great storm, Jesus is in the boat but asleep, and the disciples ask him, Master, don't you care if we drown? It feels like that when life cuts up really rough, doesn't it? And I've come across many people, even people of deep faith, who feel that God has abandoned them and doesn't care anymore when life gets stormy. And in Matthew's account, which we read today, Jesus isn't even in the boat. He's just sent the disciples away, specifically to get away from them. So no wonder some people, when life gets tough, begin to agree with Richard Dawkins that there is no God, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Well, perhaps, but it's hardly a comforting thought, is it? To get some perspective on this problem, we need to zoom out a bit and look at it from God's perspective. Among all the world's religions, there are essentially two views of God. There's what we might call the pagan view, which is that God and the world are one. Uh, everything that happens on earth, winds, floods, sunshine, etc., are all caused by a God. So that faith is about trying to appease the gods in the hope that they'll be good to you. Then there is the Abrahamic God which sees God as separate from the world. Here, God sits outside creation. Creation left to itself is a place of chaos into which God brings peace, order, beauty and meaning. 
And in ancient Jewish thought, the sea in particular was a place of chaos, a place that was still outside God's order. It's why ancient Israel, despite its long coastline, produced very few seafarers and its fishermen were seen as somewhat suspect, disreputable, suspected of being in league with the devil. Now, on first view, when life cuts up rough, at best it is a sign that there is no God, or at worst as a sign that God has forsaken you. That's on the first view, the pagan view. But on the second view, the Abrahamic view, the one that Christianity witnesses to, opens up another possibility. And nowhere is that better illustrated than in this gospel story of the storm. To understand the story fully, we need to get a sense of its context. Last week, when I was preaching at the Moreland Choristers Camp online service, still available on YouTube, I explained that this passage was the third scene in a single episode that began with Herod beheading Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, and then continued with the feeding of the 5,000, and now concludes with this episode of the stilling of the storm. The principal reason why Jesus persistently wants to be alone at this point is that he's grieving his cousin's brutal and unnecessary death. He tries to be alone in the previous scene, but the crowds follow him. And now again, he tries to be alone, but the disciples get into trouble and need him. But the key point is that he's not remote from the sufferings of the world, but part of them. He's feeling the pain too. And as I also explained last week, this whole three-scene play is acting out the 23rd Psalm. Following the execution of the people's prophet, John, by their political leaders, the people find themselves without a shepherd. The one who should have been their shepherd has become an enemy, a wolf in sheep's clothing. So Jesus responds by ensuring that his people do not want. He prepares a table for them in the presence of their enemies. He heals their sick, thereby restoring their souls. He makes them lie down in green pastures, literally commanding them to sit down on the grass. And now he leads them beside still waters. And throughout it all, he walks with his people through the valley of the shadow of death. Not just into it, but through it. The very last line of this scene has the disciples exclaiming, truly you are the Son of God. It's not the miracle that convinces them that that is the case. It is the fact that the penny has dropped. This is the good shepherd God promised his people in place of the bad shepherds of this world who lead his people astray. The bad shepherds are themselves at the mercy of the chaos and merely end up adding to the chaos. But the good shepherd continually brings order and peace out of chaos. Where Herod cut off life with a pointless death, Jesus turns death into life and meaning. So this story presents before our eyes a different view of God, one who's with us in the chaos, even when we fear we've been abandoned, and who is greater than the chaos we face. But we also get a God's eye view of ourselves in Peter's part in this story. Peter, as usual, doesn't quite get what's going on, he's a bit hot-headed, and he has an inclination to speak before he thinks. So, when he thinks he sees Jesus on the horizon, in an attempt to get Jesus to prove that it's really him, he finds himself saying, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. You can imagine what he then thinks to himself when Jesus says, OK, come then. Ah, you've really done it this time, Peter. Now, Peter, of course, is a professional fisherman. He knows what side of the boat to be on in a storm, the inside. But for all that, he steps out of the boat and find that, finds that so long as he's walking towards Jesus, he's able to walk on the water. But suddenly he looks around himself at the strong winds and the height of the waves, and he gets scared. And at that moment, he begins to sink. So Jesus reaches out his hand and saves him and says to him, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Now, I don't think Jesus is criticising Peter here. I think he's saying, look, you were doing so well. Why did you falter? But I think he's also making the point that this miracle was not just a demonstration of power by Jesus, the Son of God. It was an act of faith. So when Peter showed the same faith, he performed the same miracle. Only doubt got in the way. Peter otherwise 
was himself also able to ride the storm. You see, when Jesus performed miracles, it wasn't just him zapping the world with his God power. It was the fact that even when he faced the same waves we do, his faith in his Father was still intact, unbroken. And so the power of the Holy Spirit was able to work through him, bringing order out of chaos. And the same is true of us. When we're able to keep our faith intact, despite the waves around us, the Holy Spirit is able to work through us just as much as he did through Jesus to bring order into our chaos. So what can we draw out of this for ourselves today, right now? Well, firstly, remember that Jesus is not remote from us. He too feels the pain. If he seems to have gone silent on us when we suffer, perhaps that's because there's actually nothing to say. But he's still there, sitting beside us quietly, perhaps even grieving with us. Secondly, he is above the storms of life. When life gets stormy, he's walking on those waves, bringing order out of the chaos, bringing life out of death. But thirdly, he doesn't just calm the waves before he asks us to face them also. Not alone, we face them with him hand in hand, but it seems that we must face our fears, and that requires faith. A faith that's not cowed by the size of the waves, but is able to fix our eyes on Jesus and keep walking. And every step of that faith is going to be difficult. You would think that for Peter, getting out the boat was the hardest bit, and that once he'd taken a few steps on the water, he'd be off and away. But no, the next step was too much for him and he began to sink. And I know that feeling so well. Over and over again in my life, I've taken that big step of faith and found that Jesus was there. He held me. It worked out. And in fact, the steps of faith, fearful and faltering as they were, were more steady and sure than I would have been staying in the boat. And yet for all that, the next step of faith is always just as hard, just as fearful, just as faltering. It never seems to get any easier. Indeed, it only seems to get harder as we begin to realise just how big those waves are. All we can do is keep walking to Jesus, towards Jesus and in the end it will be okay. We might not have realised how big the waves were, but Jesus knew that all along. He was already on top of them. So if we can face the waves with our faith intact, we can make it through them and still be there when Jesus calms our storms and leads us beside those still waters as our good shepherd. Amen.
Thank you, Stuart, for your message today. Uh, we now have our time of prayer. And for each short prayer today, I invite you to respond with the response, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Through the gospel, the Lord Jesus calls us to share his glory. Let us make our prayer with him to our Heavenly Father. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for all nations, that they may seek the way that leads to peace, that human rights and freedom may be everywhere respected, and that the world's resources may be generously shared. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your church in these challenging times, that her leaders may be faithful ministers of your word, that all her members may be strong in faith and hope, and that you may be recognised in the love she bears to all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our families, especially those we're concerned about in these difficult times, and the communities in which we live, that we may find you in them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves, that in the coming week we may serve others in our work and find, find peace when we rest. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the faithful departed, that through your mercy they may rest in peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's bring all our prayers together and pray in the way the Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.